things. Um, hit the public really in the early 80s with a Mac operating system, um, which was a research operating system at uh, Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, uh, more, of, uh, more recent operating systems do use it, such as uh, Symbian and uh, Minix, which is a version of uh, Linux, I think, or Unix. Um, it doesn't require any extra hardware for virtualization. And the key point in terms of security for a microkernel is it reduces the attack surface available to um, unprivileged code in user mode by only providing a bare minimum of hardware management that's absolutely necessary. And then the servers themselves interact with this, that interact with this functionality, run purely in user mode. Um, for example, uh, Symbian, the majority of the file system code runs entirely in user mode. This also increases flexibility um, with the architecture that will be allowed with uh, the, micro uh, in the micro kernel, so there's no specific architectural constraints, the, um, such as, for example, the WDM, the Windows Drive model, or the WDK provided by Microsoft to interact with the the NT kernel itself, though this can be more awkward, it can make uh, design and imp implementation a more lengthy process. Um, an excellent example of a modern microkernel is a Microsoft uh, Singularity, which is a research operating system. Um, it's strongly typed and uses soft entirely software-based protection. So the actual kernel itself runs entirely in Ring Zero as a supervisor and relies on uh, software-based protection me mechanisms uh, to ensure that um, no code does what it shouldn't be allowed to do. So, future work. Um, some of you may well have seen this, especially if you've been using Windows for a long time. As I said, a big issue with fuzzing is uh, what happens when it blue screens. Um, the uh, crash recovery and analysis really needs to be uh, automated. Um, it's possibility, uh, there is always the possibility of running a, a VM and scripting the VM to reboot and pulling off any crash dumps from that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, what about real hardware? You can't, at the moment, interface a virtual machine with hardware installed on the host PC um, or virtualize the hardware itself. It's possible to have bug deck callbacks. Um, these can be registered. The problem with those is if the kernel is seriously corrupted, then those won't ever be called because the machine's pretty much screwed. Um, or it's the possibility of modifying the kernel itself either dynamically or statically, modifying the binary or the code at runtime um, in a similar way to provide a bug check callback, but that suffers from the same issue. Um, as I mentioned earlier, fuzzing is greatly aided by some form of st static analysis. Um, I had hoped to release some tools um, during this talk. Um, they're not finished yet, unfortunately. I'll talk about them later on. Um, but Ollie Whitehouse at Symantec has worked at, created a tool called Switchfinger um, that I'll release uh, soon. Um, and that allows, that will scan a binary for specific signatures for uh, the switch tables which uh, are used to implement uh, I.O. control interfaces, for example, thus greatly speeding up the location of um, the uh, possible entry points in uh, kernel code. Virtualizing the kernel. This is one of the tools that I'm working on. Um, to avoid blue screens, quite simply, you run the kernel code in use mode. Um, this is awkward, but doable. Um, at the moment, I've got a virtual, um, an emulation of the uh, NT kernel that's about 75% complete and just exports the same APIs and has uh, either faked functionality or the same functionality. Um, beyond that, you need to provide a virtualized or at least faked uh, IO access, uh, plug and play uh, management support and process support. Um, and you need to handle the uh, privileged uh, instructions. Generally speaking, um, no device driver should be doing things like accessing a CR3 register, the page directory base register. Um, though there's nothing to stop it from doing that, especially if it's a rootkit, for example. Um, so you need some way of trapping and handling that and returning appropriate fake values, though that's not that difficult uh, because there's user mode support for exception handling. Um, and add instrumentation for analysis and logging. So 
the idea is just have a tool which provides this environment, say, OK, run this driver, so the driver entry points run, and it will just dump out whatever uh, particular uh, entry points it finds, so any uh, user interfaces to user mode, any um, shared memory sections it creates, for example, any hardware it tries to access. And then um, uh, pass that back to uh, the user so they can then obviously speed up their uh, audit. Automated binary analysis is something I've been working on for a long time. Um, it's a very difficult problem. Um, basically, you model the CPU itself. And uh, under the current implementation, instead of using registers, meta registers are used, which have a range of values. And those values are, that range of values is then constrained by the actual code that's executed. Um, this allows for, in theory, uh, total code coverage, but um, that requires an enormous amount of state to be stored uh, if you're modifying, if you're tracing through different branches sequentially. Um, though, if you are willing to rely on heuristics, then you can obviously set, uh, pick for specific, search for specific APIs that are known to be um, have issues around particularly string handling, uh, string handling APIs, and then uh, just perform your, your analysis around that. Yeah. Uh, conclusion. So, uh, I've gone over the, an outline of the kernel architecture um, and the processor underneath and the kind of security issues that I've seen and you are likely to see um, if you're a researcher or a uh, um, consultant or developer and uh, how they can, outlines of how they can be exploited um, and specific uh, architectural implementations that could be, do, it could be used to mitigate them. Um, the current anti-kernel architecture, as I've said, due to the large amount of third-party code and uh, Microsoft code that's necessary in the kernel, provides a very large attack surface to user mode. Um, so it's quite difficult to deal with this without re-architecturing re Windows itself, which is, um, would be an enormous task and why Windows has essentially had the same kernel uh, since it was written in the late 80s. It's debatable how much effort has gone into securing kernel code. Obviously, Microsoft, um, due to their experiences with, uh, in the 90s and uh, early 2000s, have gone into a great deal of effort now to secure their code. Um, the Microsoft code that I've seen that's uh, been developed recently is uh, all pretty good, really. Um, however, third-party code, a lot of the developers I've seen when I've tried to contact vendors about bugs have either just treated it as a bug or not really been that bothered. As far as they're concerned, it's not a security issue. It's just a bug in their driver. The fact that potentially I could get remote code execution in the kernel on someone's box isn't that important. Um, some areas of the kernel have not received much attention. Uh, I mentioned uh, display drivers. There are other areas, such as uh, uh, network handling, um, which uh, all could do with a, uh, all could benefit with uh, auditing. Um, as I said, Microsoft have gone to great lengths to try and reduce the attack surface of Windows Vista, and will presumably carry on to do so for the next uh, iteration of uh, of Windows. Um, and there's a great deal of uh, scope for further research and tool development. I've outlined two particular areas, but there's, uh, in general, um, code review and uh, with the specific uh, problems related to the NT kernel itself and uh, kernel mode code. There's an awful lot that can be done. And I would add one further point. The level of third party code uh, currently in the NT kernel pretty much guarantees that Windows NT as an operating system is going to be insecure. Um, this was discussed also last week on NTDev. Uh, someone is trying to develop a device driver that switches uh, Windows. Basically, it will shut down Windows when you tell it to, and then load a secure operating system. There's a great deal of discussion as to whether this was actually doable. Um, is it possible to go from an insecure operating system into a secure operating system? And the general consensus was, which I agree with, no, you can't, because 
if there's arbitrary code running on there, um, that can always uh, interfere with the process of transitioning from unsecure to secure um, by hooking into the kernel and uh, subverting it. So, thanks for listening. Any questions? Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, the patch guard uh, discussion is on uninformed.org. Um, can you read that? Um, patch guard can, uh, so the question was uh, how much does patch guard impact on security and what difference would it make if it was introduced on 32-bit architecture um, that's a tough one um, essentially it will never be perfect it will always be possible to circumvent patch guard Microsoft can only make it arbitrarily difficult to do so um, it's up to them in terms of uh, how much effort they want to put into it, how difficult they might want to make it, uh, how, which will obviously restrict the number of people who will be able to uh, then circumvent it and uh, do whatever they want, provided they don't release a programmatic way of doing it. Um, I think any attempt to try and constrain code running in the kernel and um, minimize its uh, impact and uh, within reason what it can do uh, is a good thing, but I don't think, at the moment, uh, introducing it on a 32-bit platform would be a good idea, not least because of the amount of software it would break. Uh, the reason Microsoft introduced it on uh, the 64-bit platforms, uh, so 64-bit XP, 72K3, and Vista, um, is purely because they would, uh, the drivers would have to be rewritten for that anyway. So it, the issue of uh, backwards compatibility uh, isn't there. Um, so. I think it's a good thing, but it's not worth backporting to 32-bit. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, yes, subverting the uh, operating system uh, bootstrap process, yes. Um, sure, so he's asked uh, what, are the, what are the typical ways to subvert the uh, OS bootstrap process. Um, a colleague of mine, John Heisman, has done a lot of work on this. Um, I don't think he's talking at this Black Hat on it, when well, he's talking about EFI. Um, he talked at last Black Hat about uh, PCI uh, rootkits. PCI cards uh, support expansion ROM modules. Um, these are mapped into memory by the BIOS and then executed. So, um, yeah, that's a good way. And uh, the B-boot kit and uh, boot root are CD-based uh, um, uh, attack vectors. Um, these rely on the fact that if uh, the BIOS is set to execute from a CD first rather than the hard drive, then this code will obviously be executed. And EI's boot root as a